excited to have the opportunity. Thanks for coming out on the midweek service. I um, want to continue to pray and, uh, for uh, Tony Krieger as he recovers from an infection inside of his body. And everybody knows what that can be like. Amen. Hallelujah. So I want you to turn with me in your Bibles tonight to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. We're going to continue our study. This is our 19th week in the book of Acts. And um, uh, I think it was Cindy who asked me, how long is this study? Go. I said, well, there's 28 chapters. It's taken us 19 weeks to get to chapter 13, so I, I really can't tell you. Amen. Um, but who knows? Maybe one day with all the notes and all of the teachings that God has given us as we work through this, that um, you know, God might put it all together one day for uh, a commentary of sorts. And so, who knows? <clears throat> but I, I am really enjoying my in-depth study. How many of you ever studied the book of Acts before? Anybody ever studied it? Just a few. All right, how many have never really studied in depth the book of Acts? Raise your hand. All right, so good. We're enjoying this, right? Um, I remember it was one of my uh, first uh, assignments uh, from Pastor Rick, uh, along with the Gospels, of course, when uh, I was a young disciple and, and just gotten saved and, and working through the Word of God. Um, the book of Acts was something that he was, um, he was met wanting to make sure that the group of us young disciples understood completely what God was doing on the earth, right? Right now. Everybody say now. Right now. The book of Acts is a now kind of book. And that's why we've titled this series Unleashed. Because that's what God is doing with the church. Is God is unleashing the church. He's unleashing the church on the earth. So many times the church feels like we are, we're leashed up, we're, we're tied, we're chained up, and we can't do this because we'll violate something, or we can't do that because, well, you know, this is not allowed, that's not allowed. But God has unleashed the church on the earth. And I don't know if you understand that, but the church should be making a difference in the earth. Can you say amen? Should be making a difference. And we've moved through here how God has been strategically using the early church uh, in that same fashion, no different than today. Now, last week, we kind of ended with the fact there that, uh, you know, Paul and Paul to Cyprus. When they arrived in uh, Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues to the Jews. Everybody say, to the Jews. They also had John as their assistant. And now when they had gone through the Isle of uh, Paphos, they had found a certain sorcerer. Interesting. A false prophet. Now... You'll probably never see it in the scripture, those two connected again. He was a sorcerer and a false prophet. You, you will see the word sorcerer again, you'll see the word false prophet, but you will probably never see them connected again. Watch this. They found a sorcerer, a false prophet, who's, who's, who was a Jew. Now think about this. He's a Jew... He's a sorcerer. He's a far, false prophet whose name was Bar Jesus. Now, that, if you've ever read that before, you just think, what's that all about? All right, now let's continue because I'm going to explain. He was also the pro council so, to Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man, he was a governor. This man called Barnabas and Saul, the governor, and sought to hear the word of God. Now, that's interesting that the, a governor of Rome called Saul, who we know as Paul, and Barnabas, and he wanted them to teach, to preach, to expound the word of God. But Elamis, the sorcerer, which is his real name, right? Elamis Bar-Jesus. For so his name is translated, withstood them seeking. Now this Jew, who's a sorcerer and a false prophet, he's against Paul and Barnabas. So he withstood them seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. This proconsul, who is a governor of Rome, a Gentile, he doesn't want him to convert to Christianity. And he said, and, and listen to this, and Saul, who also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, O oh, full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil. Now somebody might have called him the son of something else, but it, he said, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, 
Will you not cease perverting the straight paths of the Lord? And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. So, Father, bless the reading of the words, the hearing of our ear, and the receiving of our heart. In Jesus' name. And everyone says? Now, it's a journey, okay? So, when you start to take a book, line upon line, precept upon precept, right? When you, when you start to study the Word of God and not just casually read the Word of God. You can't just read your Bible. You have to... That's what God wants us to do. You can't just read your Bible. You have to... You have to read your Bible. It's there for a reason. Like God's not playing hide and go seek. God's not trying to put things in there to confuse you. God's not trying to hide the great mysteries of the kingdom. Like God is trying to share everything with us through the scripture. So when we get into this and we see all these things, it's important to note. Here's a Jew who the Bible also calls a sorcerer and the Bible also calls a false prophet who's taken on the name of Jesus. What's going on here? Here is a governor of Rome who's a Gentile who's asking for the word of God to be taught. I mean, this, this, and he's asking from two of the guys who the church has just commissioned. Now watch this. We consider the critical role last week of a local church, sending out these two men, Barnabas and Saul. For the work that God had prepared them for. We talked about that. But tonight, here what we see uh, reiterated is the absolute essential for Christian mission and ministry. The sending work of the Holy Spirit of God. That's what the Holy Spirit is doing. Sending. And so we see this as critical. Now, they've gone to this isle, Paphos, right? They've gone, it's called, in the local terms, it was called Happy Isle. That's the way it's translated, the Happy Island. It might have been uh, the, our rough equivalent to a modern-day um, Hawaii or the Bahamas. All right? It was kind of like the vacation spot. It was like the, the premier spot to go, right? That's, what, that's this isle. This island that they're talking about. It's uh, Cyprus. It had been annexed by Rome some hundred years ago. And uh, it had become uh, an official province of Rome about 25 years before this takes place. And the governor of this island, which has got, I mean, like the job of jobs, right? Like how many of you would like to be the governor of Hawaii? Can you imagine living in the governor's mansion in Hawaii? Right? Diamond Head, right at the most beautiful beaches. I mean, just the, the beauty of the Lord there, right? That's this guy's job. Like, he's the governor of paradise. Think about it. His name is Sergius Paulus. Not only are we told this is where they're going, We're not really told why it was their first destination, although if you remember back in Acts chapter 4, we're told that Barnabas is from this area, so it'd be like him going home, right? Like it'd be like somebody who's, you know what I'm saying, born in Hawaii, comes over here, and and then they get, you know, sent back as uh, a missionary from this church to Hawaii, right? Like who's signing up for that? You know what I'm saying? Um... For Saul and Barnabas, it's like game on, man. Game on. Here it is. Now, their first stop is a Greek city on the east side of this island. A city of some really great size, if you study. And and there was more than one Jewish synagogue in the city. um, So that there's a lot going on there as far as Jew and the synagogues and all of this. This taking the gospel to the to the Jews first is very important. That's what we see reflected here because that's where they went. They went to the synagogue first. We see that. And, and we understand Paul, right? 
his enti- the entirety of his missionary enterprise, he lays this strategy out in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. And, and maybe we'll go there next when we're done with Acts. And this is where he writes in the gospel. You've got to think about this now. When they're writing a, a, in Romans, you've got to think about what he's saying here. He says, the power of God to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Gentile. Paul writes that in Romans, doesn't he? And so the reason we can see Paul writing that in the book of Romans is because he practiced it in the book of Acts. And right here we see it. They went to the synagogue first. They went to the synagogue first. In every synagogue, there would be a God-fearing non-Jews that went there as well as devout Jews. And these Gentiles would be good networkers opening the doors for other non-Jews that were taking place. So on the island, they journeyed to the capital city uh, of Paphos on the west coast. They, it's about a 90-mile journey. That the audience of the governor, imagine that, Sergius Paulus, And this is where they receive an astonishing invitation. Now think about this. This is almost like the President of the United States calling you up on the phone saying, Tim, I want Tim Carpenter to come to the White House and I want him to teach the Word of God to me. Now, I know what you're thinking. Because you're thinking, the president we have right now would never do that. That's exactly what I want you to think. Because no Jew would ever think that a Roman governor would do that either. I think Tim's up for the job. But if you see here in verse 6 and 7, when they had gone through the Isle, uh, island to Paphos, the, the capital city, they found a certain sorcerer there, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was the, with the proconsul uh, Sergius Paulus. So he's the governor. And, and they tell you that Sergius Paulus was an intelligent man. Right there. The Bible. Listen, when other people call you smart, that's pretty good. But when the Scripture calls you smart, you better... And so this man, Sergius Paulus, called Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. What an, an amazing invitation. This was, like, this was like a command performance. This wasn't like, oh, the, the president just happened to be online one day, scrolling through, came across F, Firm Foundation Ministries' website and listened to Tim Carpenter preach a sermon. No, this was a command performance. Like you're coming here, like the secret service is coming to get him. You're coming with us. They didn't seek out this opportunity, but it was a opportunity nonetheless. Governors in Rome, um, they liked to know what was going on in the provinces. Like they didn't really hinder re- other religions at all, but they liked to know what was going on. It was very important because they wanted to know anything that might happen in their province that would serve to create a distraction or disruption underneath their rule. So they wanted to know, even though they didn't ever hinder other religions, but they wanted to know what was going on right in this. There's more in mind uh, of Sergius Paulus here than merely quelling some kind of unrest that might happen because of Barnabas and, and Saul. The Bible says that he wanted to hear the word of God. Did you read that in your Bible? It didn't say he was interested in warning them, don't you cause any trouble in my city. Like, preach your religion, preach your gospel, but don't cause any trouble in my city. I've heard about the gospel in these other cities and how the whole city gets turned upside down. That's not happening here. He didn't do that. The Bible says that he called them to him because he wanted to hear the word of God. Was this for civic reasons? Why did he want to hear the word of God? Was it out of a desire to find truth? Were were his motives somewhat mixed in it all? Like I I read in a commentary from uh, R.B. Rackham, and he says this. He says this. Among the Roman aristocrats were many who were tired of the skepticism of Christianity. 
And many of the Roman aristocrats picked up on Pilate's question, what is truth, when Pilate asked that of Jesus? What is truth? And they wanted to know. They said, we want to know. There were many who were, who were tired of the skepticism and said, we want to know the truth. And so here is a man who the Bible says is keen in mind. He's very educated. He's an intelligent man. He understands science. He understands history. According to the Roman historian uh, Pliny, he says he, he, used a, 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 he, had a, he had all of these going on, but he had a huge lack of understanding of spiritual things. And so Rackham continued, he said, in the Greek world, it was custom for philosophers and religious propagandists to travel from city to city and give public speeches. When Circus Paulus heard of Barnabas and Saul, watch this, he took them for similar professors. And having an interest, he's, I know a lot of things, but I really don't know much about this, this spiritual thing. He summoned them to his court. What is the teaching? What is the philosophy? What new insight could these traveling preachers provide to me? No one could have imagined the events that are about to take place. Because not only is there an astonishing invitation, there's a non-astonishing opposition. Now, in my mind, I'm going, what? Look at verse 8. But Elamis, the sorcerer, for his name was translated by Jesus, withstood them, seeking to turn the governor, the proconsul, Away from the faith. Now, Bar Jesus, this Elamis, would have been a natural member of uh, Paulus's court. He was employed by the governor as some, let's just say, um, Merlin. Uh, that's a title. It's not. It's not a a, a name. Uh, the the Merlin of the court would be the 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 court wizard or the the guy who would be knowledgeable in the art of spiritualism. How about that? He was the Merlin. He was the court wizard. Okay, and so they they all would have one because you know they were Romans. They were they were Gentiles. They they worshipped Rome basically and Caesar. But he he found this guy who's who's not only this court wizard type kind of guy, but he's a Jew. So he's going to understand a lot of the people that uh, Paulus is governing. He's going to have some insight. So not only is he like a court wizard, but he's an advisor. He's an advisor inside of this, and so. He's far more interested, this bar Jesus, he's far more interested in his own well-being than he was in the glory of God. And so much so that we see here that he's willing to become some pseudo-religious quack in order to make a buck and keep his life comfortable. Now, we don't know any of those in the modern day. It's possible given his name. Now, I'm just going to take a little bit of learned scripture that I have over the last 20 years, and I'm going I'm to make this statement to you. It's possible, given his name, that he's trading on the name of Jesus, bar Jesus. Because everybody knows who Jesus is. Everybody knows the miracles that Jesus used to do. Everybody understands they were undeniable, they were unstoppable, all of this was going on, and so he's trying to make his living as some sort of supposed spiritual descendant of Jesus among a group of people who wouldn't know any better. He's bar Jesus, he's of Jesus. And since he's of Jesus, then he has these, these same kind of powers. And not only that, now he's a religious teacher and advisor in a Roman court. Come on, somebody. This guy's got himself set. He's got himself set. So here's the thing I want you to think about. 
What motive would this sorcerer have for trying to distract Sergius Paulus? From the gospel. I only know of one reason. Because he'd likely be out of a job if the governor converted. If the governor became a Christian, this guy's likely going to be out of a job. As a Christian, what need do I have of sorcery? As a Christian, what need do I have of incantations? As a Christian, what need do I have of a soothsayer or a fortune teller when I can communicate directly to the one who set my future in order before all of eternity was put into place? Why do I need someone to read the stars for me when I can talk directly to the one who hung the stars? So this guy, he's, his job's on the line. If the governor converts to Christianity, I'm not going to have a job anymore. Hello, somebody. So that's why I, I labeled that non-astonishing. I mean, it's not surprising that this guy would oppose Barnabas and Saul. And so this imposter... That's what the Bible called him. I didn't call him. He's a false prophet. The Bible called him an imposter. Set out to distract the governor to destroy the work of the gospel. And it was proclaimed. Now watch this because this is good. There's an astonishing boldness. I love it here. Watch 9. Then Saul, who also called, was called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit. Everybody say filled. filled. That's not P-H. That's F-I-L-L-E-D. Okay, so I, you just got to read your scripture and listen. You, you'll be all right. He looked intently at him. Boy, I mean, again, one of those moments where you wish you could have been there. Do you, you ever got the look? Has anybody ever got the look? Every guy in this room better raise your hand. <laughs> you got the look. Man. And listen to what he said, verse 10. Oh, full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil. I mean, can you see everybody's jaw hit the floor in this place? No one's ever talked to the sorcerer like that. Do you understand who he is? He'll cast a spell on you. He'll prophesy doom on you. He's the sorcerer. He, he looked at him and said, you, full of all deceit, fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? Wow. Like you talk about a scolding. But who better? Who better to give it? Well, then Saul, who we know as Paul, who began his own journey perverting the way of the Lord. Killing Christians. Burning churches. Who better than to see it, to know it, and understand it? I mean, there's a boldness. Again, here's a side note for you, just a little soapbox. Saul was also called Paul. Now, maybe for a light reader of the Bible, this might pass. But for us, it's not going to because you can't just read your Bible. You have to... All right, so that's Pastor Don's encouragement to you. For the casual reader of the Bible, you'll probably never know, know this but you're going to know it because you're not a casual reader. Saul, who's also called Paul, watch this. Saul's his Jewish name. It's the first name, listen, of the first king of Israel. He would have wore that proudly. Anytime you say his name, you think about the first king of Israel. That's his Jewish name. He would have carried that very, very proudly. But he's also a... Greek, isn't he? And so Paul is his Greek name. Grab this. And the one by which Luke will refer to him from now on, Paul. Saul's his Jewish name. Paul's his Greek name. Hello, somebody. Isn't it interesting that God often renames people according to mission?
Saul says in Romans, I've got to carry the gospel to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. From this moment on, watch what happens. Paul begins to take the lead carrying the gospel to the Greek. So, his name is very important. All Jews would have known him as Saul. And he's carrying the gospel to the Jews. The Gentiles or Greeks would know him as Paul. He's carrying the gospel to the Gentiles. See, you're not a light reader, so you understand that now. Because what happens here, this signals the change in mission that the apostle would undergo taking the gospel now directly to the Gentiles. That's why his name has changed. Isn't it amazing? Paul carrying the gospel to the Greeks. Saul carried the gospel to the Jews. Church, that's deep. That's so deep. God often changes names to declare mission. Somebody's name got changed to Israel. You remember? Who was him? Who got changed to Israel? Thank you. Somebody's not a light reader. Very good. Jacob mean what? Cheater. Usurper. Deceiver. Now, if your name is Jacob, thank God for redemption. Israel means what? Prince of God. God changed his name according to mission. Abram means exalted father. Right? So I'm the father, you worship me. Abraham means the father of nations. I'm here to serve you. God changes names according to mission. It's incredible here. So now you're not a light reader of the scripture anymore, are you? Hello? So Paul's a Roman citizen. He's a Roman citizen. And he traveled throughout Rome, dominating all of the, all of the Roman world with the gospel there. And he's presenting it to Roman citizens far and wild. And this, in, this exchange in the court of Sergius Paulus was unprecedented. It was amazing because this is incredible. He was, he was in this new surrounding and he was presenting this message. Now, not in a synagogue to a group of people, but now as a Roman citizen, he is presenting the message of the gospel directly to the head political Roman leader of the world in that area. Incredible! It'd be like Tim preaching the gospel to President Obama. I'm prophesying tonight, y'all not paying attention. Somebody's writing that down. I can see it right now. This gradual radiation outward of the gospel message, this time in the sense of Paul going where the gospel had never gone before. That's a little sci-fi reference, it's okay. To the, to the very courts of Rome. To the very courts of Rome. Notice what Paul does. Man, he uses some harsh words but he uses them in the power of the Spirit. Pay attention. Now, I'm gonna, Paul doesn't... He, he doesn't beat around the bush. How about that? He doesn't beat around the bush with this shyster, Bar-Jesus. He, he calls him names. I mean, like, Jesus never did that. Right. But he does it under the influence of the Holy Spirit Sounds a little intolerant to me, doesn't it, to you? It doesn't really play well in our day. Does it? I mean, this isn't a day when we're, we're wrestling with political correctness. You don't even know what word to use anymore. I mean, people can't even decide which bathroom to go to anymore. Right? In a world we live in, we're, we're supposed to not only be tolerant, but we're supposed to be nice and harmless and, and do our little church thing over in the corner, but not be offensive to anybody. Look, look, pay attention here. 
we must speak the truth in love. Can everybody say amen? amen? And we shouldn't be needlessly offensive or putting stumbling blocks in the way of anybody. Hear me well, church. We should not be needlessly offensive. We should never be putting stumbling blocks in the front of people. So it's easy for our flesh to get in the way because where's the balance? Because the word of God reminds me always that the anger of man does not work the righteousness of God. And I mean, like I used to be a very angry man and continue to be reminded when my anger comes that there's no righteousness going to work out of this. Hello, somebody. But sometimes we just got to tell it like it is. And sometimes, some people might deem that as ugly. And the truth will sometimes be offensive to those who choose to call evil good and good evil. And that's not my problem. Are you with me? It doesn't give me a license to tell everybody off who doesn't see eye to eye with me. There's a man who's determined to block the work of God, to keep Sergius Paulus from coming to the faith, and it was for his own selfish reasons, and Paul called him out on it. He told him the truth in in no uncertain terms, and he did so not in the flesh but by the power of God. Bingo. So the real question comes to the use of hard words To me, it's about the stakes involved. If someone, let me just say this, and I was in in Menards early this morning, I had to go over and pick up a couple of things before I came in the office, and and so they've got their Halloween garbage all over the place, right? Oh, man, here we go. And so I was thinking about this. If someone laced Halloween candy with cyanide, and I knew it, I wouldn't concern myself with niceties and little subtle hints. I wouldn't concern myself with the finest conversation. Like, I'm going to be screaming at kids not to put that candy in their mouth. And I'm not worried about whether they get offended over it. I'm not worried about whether they cry about it. And I'm going to condemn the one who did it. Amen. Now that raises a question for us. Is the message of the gospel our truth or is it the truth? Is Jesus the only way or isn't he? Are there people who are going to be offended by your and mine answer over that? Somebody needs to say yes. I'm just an audience participation night. You're okay. There are people who are going to be offended over that. There are people who are going to say, why do you as a Christian believe? Why do you as a Christian believe that your way is the only way? There are all kinds of religions in the world. Let me tell you why I believe. Because mine is the only faith that starts with Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 in the beginning. No other faith on the planet earth begins there. Y'all didn't get that. There's not another faith that begins at Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Every other faith, every other religion starts somewhere else down the line. That's going to be offensive to some because like Tim and I were talking today, there are a whole lot of people who believe in evolution. Millions of years. Hello, somebody. Now, I understand the fears of some, the Speaking in such radical terms could lead to extremism. We've seen that. Religion can be the most extremist thing in the world, right? right. Um, we're dealing with one now that creates a lack of peace in the world. Hello, somebody. There are contemporary examples, too. Um, Islam. And history even records... Examples among professing Christians. Crusades. Like, I love everything Renaissance, but let's face it, the Crusades had nothing to do with the gospel. They had nothing to do with the gospel. 
Why do, why do I say that? Because let's be clear about this. Any attempt to forcibly convert a person to faith is contrary to the Bible. It's contrary to the Spirit of Christ. It's contrary to our very mission. It's destined for failure. Somebody say amen. To coerce belief is to not get real heart belief. What it does is, is rather an outward conformity to a legalistic counterfeit of what you're actually proclaiming. If I could force a person in this world to convert, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. Nor would any true follower of Jesus. Because we understand that faith not freely chosen isn't faith at all. That being said, the issue is the stakes involved. Amen? There's some stakes involved here, what's going on in the Scripture. Watch this. Now, I'll put this up here because I want you to pay attention to this. If Jesus is who he said he is, if the gospel is the only way that we can find peace with God, if this message is true, think about it now. Not merely one more option among many. Then we've got to contend for that truth. Is that okay? Yeah. Sure it is. And this is the, in the day and age we live. That makes us unpopular in some quarters. I know that. But get used to it. They killed Jesus. And we're whining... <laughs> because they want to threaten to force to pass some laws against us. They killed Jesus. Watch this. There's some folks who won't like it. When we say the things we must say and take a stand that the Bible compels us to take, there's some people who aren't going to like it. They're not going to like it. I, I mean, I can't apologize for that because it's the truth. And so what we see here, what we see here inside of this is, is, is so be it. Why? Because eternity's at stake. Do you understand that? There's an astonishing invitation that takes place. They get invited to come and preach the word of God to a governor at his invite. No surprising that the one guy who, uh, who's there is opposing them because he's, he's going to lose his job. Right? Like he doesn't care anything about God. He only cares about his wealth. And, and then there's boldness, astonishing boldness that takes place. But watch this. There's a judgment that happens. It'll blow your mind. Now, to the casual observer, all right? Pay attention now. The casual reader of the Bible are going to go, oh, that's harsh. Like that's real. Paul. Paul says, that's it, I'm sick of you, I'm sick of your garbage, and God is sick of you too, you're going to be blind. That's pretty harsh. Hello, somebody. Like, I mean, that's pretty harsh. We get to the place where we say, man. But listen, let's go back to the last point here. We're dealing with the eternal truths, aren't we? We're dealing with the eternal destinies of people, the spreading of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and God's plan will not be foiled by some imposter with an agenda of self-interest. Hello, church. Besides, the affliction is temporary, so get over it. Even in the scripture, he says, for a time. And who else who's in a position, other than Paul, to be able to speak that kind of judgment? A man himself was blind for a little while. So Bar Jesus, by opposing the gospel of Jesus, showed himself to be who he really was. Not a friend of God. Not a friend of the governor. And definitely not a friend of Paul's. So Saul had been struck blind by God himself on the road to Damascus. Remember that? It was through his blindness. Now, you've got to go back and read that. It's incredible because through his blindness, he found the light of Christ. See, let me tell you something. Often in your life, 
when you think you're going through the darkest times is when you find the reality of the light of God. Amen. And I know there are some people in here who can deeply testify of that. When you thought everything was lost, everything's over, it was in that moment where you found the purest light of God and your life was transformed. Paul was in that place. And so therefore, Paul is not afraid to speak this to this man because he knows if this man will respond properly, God will transform his life. Hello, somebody. Let me just tell you this. An affliction is not the worst thing that can happen to you. It's not. Even though at the moment we think it is. Now, we don't know if this ever happened to bar Jesus. I, I don't know if he ever converted. But regardless, the demonstration of the power of God was so impressive that the governor, the governor saw it. And because of it, there is an astonishing conversion. It's so good. Verse 12. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done being astonished, what now? Not at the miracle. Remember why he asked him to come to start with? To teach the word of God. But the Bible says he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Like the teaching of the word of God came and followed it was signs and wonders. That's the pattern of the New Testament. The word of God is preached and is followed by signs and wonders. The word of God is preached and is followed by signs and wonders. The word of God is preached and is followed by signs and wonders. It's the pattern of the New Testament. It should be the pattern of the modern day church. But oftentimes in church, the only power is in the light switch. And what's sad is most Christians prefer it that way. So I'm talking about all this healing. Because what if we pray for them and they don't get healed? You well, who are you, God? Like God didn't say be God. He said pray for healing and trust my sovereignty. Right. Hello, somebody. I've prayed for people and seen them get healed. My wife and I prayed for a Down syndrome baby. Saw them got healed. Well, we also prayed for somebody with cancer and they died. I was praying for an aunt of mine at the hospital. No lie. In Graceville, Florida. My family didn't know any other preacher. She's in the hospital and she's she got lung cancer. Uh, smoked all her life. She has lung cancer and she's in the hospital. She's really struggling. And, and they called the hospice in and, and they called. I was at work. I was cutting meat. And say, they said, Don, you have to come right away. So I, I got in the car. I took off my meat coat. I went right up there. <clears throat> walked in the hospital and immediately walking in the room, I could feel, I could feel the presence of God. And immediately I knew God's about to take her home. I don't know if you've ever been in the room. This is not a prayer, this is not a prayer for healing. But my family who doesn't know Jesus, I'm the only preacher they know, is expecting me to pray a prayer of miracle and see God do this thing, right? So I went over, her name was Kat, and I don't know, we called her Kat, and I went over and said, Aunt Kat, I want to pray for you, and she nodded her head. And, and I said, I'm going to pray for this storm of sickness in your life to end. And everybody gathered around, and they were like, yes, that's what we want to happen. So I said, can I lay my hands on you and pray? And she nodded. She had all these things on. She couldn't open her eyes, but she, she nodded her head. And so I prayed. I said, Father, let the storm of cancer end in Jesus' name. And I said, amen. And as soon as I said, amen, all the machines went flat. Instantly. My family was upset. I just backed away in the corner because I knew that's what God was doing. Like her storm of cancer did end. And what I got to share with my family afterwards was like, they're like, oh, we're never going to have you pray for us. <laughs> I said, you, you need to understand what you saw was God answer our prayer. And I wouldn't be sad about it at all. Like, why would we want her to continue to suffer like that? 
If God's sovereign over everything, why don't we trust his sovereignty to answer our prayers? We don't know if Bar Jesus ever, ever, ever converted. But what we do know is there's a conversion who's taken place here. And this is incredible. Because of the teaching of the word of God, Paul's harsh words, they didn't turn the governor away. Rather, they caused him to believe. Now, here's clear evidence, at the very least, that some of his descendants were followers of Jesus of Nazareth. There's clear evidence that that some of the descendants of the governor in this area followed Jesus. And I don't have time to share all that with you tonight. You You need to study the word of God. But I can say this, that previously in the household of Cornelius, which we've all, a Gentile family we've already talked about, came to faith through Peter's witness. And, uh, and the church at Jerusalem had, for the most part, accepted this fact, okay, that God is now moving on the Gentiles. But it's as if they didn't want to think through the implications of a Gentile family coming to faith through a direct witness of the word of God. It's like, I don't know. So here Paul takes the gospel message to this governor directly. Like, Paulus hadn't been in the attendance of any synagogue. He isn't one of the God-fearing Gentiles with much previous knowledge of Jewish ways. And yet the Bible said he believed. Now this makes Sergius Paulus the first thoroughly Gentile converted to faith. Now Cornelius was familiar with the synagogues. He had been in there. He understood the Jewish ways. But Sergius Paulus had never experienced any of that. So now this makes him the first thoroughly Gentile to convert to the faith in Christ. A man with no devotion to any Jewish religion. And folks, pay attention to that because this makes this man the first in line of what includes most of us. And it's this instance, this situation... This circumstance that changes Paul's thinking. While he will always go to the Jewish synagogues to take the gospel first to the Jews, he now will be more willing to share the message of Christ with whoever will listen, Gentile or Jew. We see that in Rome. We see that in the book of Romans. He clearly writes it. So it's significant. I think it's a significant development in the fact that Luke listed as one of the most um, innovative things that happens during the first missionary journey. That's uh, Acts chapter 14, which we're going to get there, and Acts chapter 15. I'm not going to read those tonight, but what I want you to pay attention to is that Sergius Paulus was a man of intelligence. In other words, he wasn't going to be swayed by some kind of dog and pony show. He's already got one of those in his courtroom. He's an intelligent man. Like he didn't go to bar Jesus and say, you're the sorcerer, you're the court advisor, you are the guy who's supposed to be this prophet. You tell me about the word of God. He, he, he already had that dog and pony show. He knew what it was. He said, you bring me those two guys, those two guys because they're reality. That's so good, man. See, like when when the world begins to ask you as a Christian to explain to them the kingdom of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ, not because you've got some kind of license or you've got some kind of title, but because in your life they see Jesus as a reality, that's when we're making a difference, church. I love it that he wasn't really astonished at the miracle of the man being blinded. What astonished him was the teaching of the Lord. That is so good. To this learned man, this educated man, the word of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ made perfect sense. And the Bible says he believed. Now, I know there's all kind of arguments because here what they say is, oh, well, we're not real sure if he believed because Acts never tells us whether he got baptized. There's a whole lot of people that you call heroes or that you see God moving on that you're never going to doubt their conversion. The Bible doesn't tell you they got baptized either. So stop it with all the nonsense. Should we get baptized? Absolutely. Somebody say yes. Did we do that this past Sunday? Yes. 
If you, you need to make a public de- declaration through baptism that you're following Christ. Absolutely. But don't get locked up in all of that that the proconsul didn't believe because nobody testifies of his baptism. That's foolishness. It's just not biblical. And it, it bothers me. You probably couldn't tell that. It's a common idea that Christian faith is for people who have checked their minds at the door. Ted Turner actually said, Ted Turner, I'm going I'm to quote him in just a second. Everybody knows who Ted Turner is. You know what he said? He said, Christianity is for losers. That's what Ted Turner said. Faithless, faithless.org, it says that where any hint of faith is derived for a variety of reasons, there's foolishness. Richard Dawkins wrote The God Delusion. It's a book. Sam Harris wrote The End of Faith. Chris Hitchens wrote God is Not Great. All of these contemporary books critique the faith of Christ both as un reasonable and foolish is Christianity for losers are we engaged in an illusion are we building our lives and banking our eternity on wishful thinking I'm just asking a question is the whole idea of God as Dawkins would suggest Merely an illusion that vanishes when you look at it closely. Can God be proven in a test tube? Spoken of with absolute and utter certainty, can God be proven? Regardless of what you think your answer is right now, when it comes right down to it, our faith in God is just that, church. It's faith. It's faith. And the Bible says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. I I can't take, I can't, no Bible teacher, no denomination should ever try to remove faith from your life. Like, as Christians, we believe in science. Do you understand that the Bible is a great scientific book? Sure it is. The psalmist writes in the book of Psalms that the earth was a sphere. In the book of Psalms, yet up until Christopher Columbus does not sail across or over the edge of the earth, everybody believed the earth was flat. But the psalmist writes, the earth was a sphere. The psalmist writes that the stars sing to the glory of God. And we have just discovered in our lifetime through telescopes that listen to outer space that stars actually make noises. How could the psalmist have known that? Don't tell me that the Bible's not a scientific book, church. It is. It's just not hocus pocus. It's not built on theories. It's not built on suggestions or ideas. It's not built on some crazy white uh, ideology to try and find something to prove that our ideology is true. It's built on the truth, and God speaks to us and says that through faith, you need to believe that I am who I am. I can't, no faith, no religion, no study, nothing, no Bible teaching should ever try to remove faith from your life. But here's the good news. That's exactly what's required to please God. Faith. Don't be discouraged by it. Be excited about it. Let me add two things to it quickly. I got six minutes. One, there's no person under the sun who can get away from the concept of faith. I don't care who you are. 
I'm, I'm sorry, I don't care who you are. There's not a person on the planet Earth that can get away from the concept of faith. Richard Dawkins and his friends place great faith in the conclusion of modern-day science. For instance, sorry, but I honestly do not have enough faith to believe that what we see all around us happened as a result of random accident and unguided evolutionary forces. I'm, I'm sorry, I just can't, I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't believe it. Just look at life around you. Look at life around you. Can you look at life around you and say, all of this happened by accident? Come on. I, I, was, I, I was messing with my alligator yesterday, right? So I've got messing, I'm over there messing around with Dundee, and she's hissing and spitting, doing her thing. She's just being an alligator, right? So I'm looking at this creature. And, and for me, I'm thinking, all my life I've been in the woods, all my life I've hunted, all my life, I mean, I've always been around animals. So I'm looking at this creature, and I'm just kind of staring at it, and I think, you know what, God? That, it's so uniquely made, right? Like it's got leather for skin. Hello, somebody. You, you know what I'm saying? Like it's, it's highly intelligent. Now, my wife threatens to make a purse out of it every day. You can leave her alone. She's just... I mean, when you look at life, when you look at it in its, its purest form, you, it, that's not a happen chance. It's not. The very first question, which I think is insuperable for uh, Darwinist, is a simple one. Why is there something instead of nothing? That's what I love to ask everybody who tells me, oh, I'm not a creationist, I'm an evolutionist. Here's my question. Why is there something instead of nothing then? I mean, it's, there's always stunned silence. I mean, if you're so confident, why is there something instead of nothing? I mean, it's just amazing, right? Oh, all right, number two, quickly. Our faith is not a mere blind. It's not like oh, oh, we're lambs who are just zombies. We're just No, we, it's not wishful thinking. Instead, it's, it's faith which rests upon actual historical depictions inside of God's inerrant word. And believe me, you, the word of God is inerrant. It is inerrant. People try to tell me all the time, they'll find places, see, the Bible contradicts itself. No, the Bible interprets itself. The contradiction is in the way you interpret it. If you let the Bible interpret itself, there's no contradiction. There's no contradiction. It's faith which has its reasons, which makes sense in the judgment of so many the best the best, most rational explanation possible for the world that you and I live in, for the human condition, for who we are, is the fact that God is who he said he was. In fact, some of the most brilliant people of our existence were followers of Jesus. Did you know that? It was the Christian faith that gave rise to modern science. Don't think it wasn't. Absolutely was. For instance, with men like uh, Bacon, with men like Corpicus, with men like Galileo and Kipler, with men like Newton. Just being Christians. Despite the rise, I believe, of Darwinism in modern day times, many scientists today still follow Christ. We've got a man running for president of the United States right now who is a neurosurgeon. He... he He's a brain surgeon. He understands how, not only how the, body, the human body works, but he understands how the human brain works. And yet he professes that it was all created by the hand of God. And someone asked him, what do you think quali you, qualifies you to be president of the United States? He says, well, it's not brain surgery. 
a great answer. That's a great answer. You would think most doctors now, because they understand the human body would become, you know, evolutionists and those type of things. And I just love the fact that he is a, a, an unapologetic believer. I just love it. And I, because why? There are plenty of good apologetic works that's been done in defense of Christianity and its faith by some of the finest minds in the world, even down to our present day. We need, we need to be people who don't shrink back because of critics. We need to play serious thought. Like, I think the followers of Christ should be the people who can be the most intelligent people on the face of the planet. Let me ask you a few questions as we close. Do we follow Christ by faith? Absolutely and unashamedly. Absolutely and unashamedly. But it's faith that rests on a solid foundation. And the good news is that no one needs a PhD in order to follow Jesus. Nor are PhDs excluded from following Jesus. A thinking man like Sergius Paulus put his faith in Christ. He was astonished at the word of God and that it was accompanied by the power of God. And even today, when we really consider the reality of our sinfulness and the magnitude of God's grace in comparison, I don't know about you, but I find the gospel astonishing. I find the gospel astonishing. Do you find it easy to lose a sense of astonishment that Christ would save sinners like me and you? Does that mean is it easy just to lose that sense of awe that Jesus saves sinners? And if so, why? Why do we lose that sense of awe and astonishment? And so my, my, my thoughts are, what are some of the things that would help us keep that sense of wonder in our lives? Let me tell you what it is. Nothing breathes life into a church more than new converts. Nothing. Nothing creates bigger mess in a church than new converts. Because when you create babies, you got to change diapers. When a church lets the conversion of people to Christianity take a side note to its traditions and its practices, we will lose a sense of awe that Jesus saves. But when as a church... We realize that our top priority and mission on the earth is to take the gospel where it's never been before. We will never lose a sense of awe at Jesus saving people. Incredible, isn't it? I think the gospel is astonishing. That's just me, but y'all stand with me. So, Father, we love you. We thank you for tonight and this teaching. We thank you for this great book, the book of Acts, the continuing of the kingdom. Lord Jesus, so many people need you. Help us, God, to make their conversion our top priority, to not shy back because we think that what we believe might offend this one or that one. Lord, we are beginning to understand that Christianity is a faith that was intended to rock the boat. Not out of arrogance, but simply because there are people who are in the boat who are asleep and it's time for the church to wake them up. Would you give us that boldness and that liberty? Would you let us continue to see conversions in your name? We pray it in Jesus' precious name. And everyone said...
Give the Lord a hand of prayer. Praise. Turn around and tell somebody you love them in Jesus' name.